And Marie, your work has evolved so beautifully in the last few years, and it's, it's wonderful because we've seen some of your earlier periods of work, and can you tell us a little bit about the fluid nature of your modern work, the work that you've just created? Um, well, if we're talking about, about these, they're, they're not just exactly just my most recent, but uh, lately I've been painting more with the, the smaller ones, the uh, plein air paintings outside. Yes. But, uh, but these I've painted in my studio and uh, where I live, and, uh, and they're mainly um, uh, my feelings about the... Uh, I have a really nice view out of my, out of my window, as you probably saw. So they're inspired by the view? The view, so the, the, uh, the ocean and... Uh, and um, just the ocean views and so on. Yeah, so, and the colors, I like to use colors. So in a way that is like drawing from the plain air because yeah. when you're doing plain air, you're, you're actually in the landscape yeah. and you're, you're yeah. uh, creating the impression you're seeing in front of you. And sometimes and I find it more difficult to paint on, on plain air because somehow I'm sort of distracted by um, uh, the actual things I'm seeing in front of me. Whereas in my studio, I can just uh, make it up. And, uh, <laughs> so part of it is, is inspired by the light or, or something that catches your eye and then, and then the rest is, is pure in creativity. The, in the studio I can just uh, use the colors and shapes that I um, that, that come to me with um, my, you know, not, not just seeing them visually but just uh, what, how I feel about the, the landscape well, and the seascape like around me. Your colors are also very distinctive. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the colors that you choose and how you pull them together is very rich. You know, like for instance in here you have these beautiful purple tones that are coming in and then the, just the, the, the brilliance of the sky and the way that the water um, reflects that or pulls those colors together and it, it's really the water I find the most exciting because it, it has a, a life of its own. I try using just a few colors and not uh, putting all the colors together but uh, just letting a few co colors work together. Um, well, that's wonderful, and, and I understand that you've recently been a guest at the the uh, Windsor Art Group. Yeah. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah. Well, they're just such a very warm, uh, uh, friendly group of people who are painting on, uh, at the Windsor uh, Park Recreation Center, I think it is. And. Um, so I was, I, I just, uh, I think this is the second or third year that they asked me to do this. Uh, I think they have different artists come maybe once in a while, uh, every Monday probably, uh, to paint with them. And so you paint and, uh, with them? Um, I do a little demo for them and then... Okay. And, then, uh, and, then and then in the Windsor Park. Yeah, and then, then like, yeah, I leave time for them to paint and just give them a little, you know, encouragement or advice or whatever. Yeah. It, it is encouraging for, I think it's encouraging for all artists to learn from somebody else, to have somebody else show them their techniques. And, and it was so interesting because I talked with Robert Amos once about his uh, experience in Japan. Mm -hmm. And he said that um, when, you, when you're brought to a Japanese artist's studio, you're expected to perform. Like, they want to see how you do it. And, and so, you know, here's a piece of paper and there's some brushes. Show us. Show us what you know. And, and they're very excited to learn from another artist. And, and and I think it's a universal thing, you know, that, that um, you have so much to give and and that the way that your work has evolved. And, and the other thing that I really, that in, I find really wonderful is that you're embracing scale. Like your your work has grown both in, in the, um, the, the medium itself, the dimension and the abstraction of your work, but also in the scale that you're presenting. And that, that must be very rewarding for you. Yeah, yeah. I like to work on a larger canvas. And well, thank you so much, Ray. And um, the show that we have at Eclectic is up for, for the month of October, and uh, we invite you all to come and see Marie's work. Thank you.
And Birgit, your your work is just phenomenal. I love these sculptural forms. Thank you very and much. they're so interesting because one artist was telling me tonight that he feels like you've blended Henry Moore with Picasso. Wow. <laughs> what a huge compliment that is. Well, thank you, whoever he was. Really? Okay, well, I'm gonna take that. <laughs> How did you come up with these forms? Most of my work is like that, it's very organic, and uh, I guess because my inspiration does is very grounded in nature itself. I know it sounds kind of trite and corny and everyone says, oh, nature is my inspiration, but, but really, truly it is. I'm very, um, very deeply connected to um, the natural world, especially to the ocean side. And, uh, you know, nature is so incredible. There aren't, there, it's all about beautiful um, curves and sensuous lines. Like our, 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 our universe is a curve, it's, it's all curves. It's all sexy curves. I mean, who can resist the sexy curves of the universe, right? So that kind of stuff comes out in my work quite a bit, yeah. Buckminster, Buckminster Fuller, I don't know if you know of his work, he, he said one of the greatest flaws of mankind is that we fail to realize that the earth is, is round and that all lines should be curved. Yes. You know, there is no such thing as yes. a straight line. I don't do straight lines. <laughs> I don't think I could if I tried. <laughs> it shows up in your work. I mean, I, I think that the forms are exquisite and the sense of balance in your pieces is really, really wonderful. And um, I know that this is your most recent piece. Series. Can you tell us how you came to that? Sure. Um, this actually, uh, this series, and actually, all of my newest work is informed by an experience that I had last December 27th in the Baja. I was, and I'll just be very brief about it, but I was uh, sea kayaking on a double kayak with a fellow that I had just met there. And the gray whales, they migrate down there. So there's about 20,000 gray whales everywhere. We had gone out whale watching. And we we're stupidly far offshore, maybe a couple of miles. And we'd had amazing sightings that day. And we we're just floating, about to head back in. And we saw two whales heading north. We could see their tails going up and down. And so Perry, the fellow that I was with, um, we were just on a plastic sit-on um, kayak, and so he reached below the waterline and made this squeaky sound on the edge of the kayak, and the whales turned west. And so we thought, oh, well, they've responded, so let's, we thought, let's try to triangulate their position. So we paddled hard for a while, and then we just stopped. And I said to Perry distinctly, I said, wouldn't it be cool if they came up right here? And it's like one of those things where be careful what you say, because not 10 minutes later, the first whale breached about 25 feet this way of us, like full body breach, head to tail, out of the out of the water, terrifying, way too close, and so we're screaming, and I'm turning around to brace myself for the wave that's coming, it's like a five foot wave that's coming, and just as I'm doing that, the second whale breached right where you're standing, like right directly in front of me, and they're gray whales, so they're like a bus, right, they're 60,000 pounds and 50 feet long, and I'm looking up, and I'm so confused, like I don't know what's happening, right, I'm looking up and up, and all I see is whale, and then I realize, that I'm gonna die now this is it there's no escaping this whale thing right so there was confusion there was no life flashing it was just like okay and then I just bowed my head and I completely surrendered my life like I utterly surrendered my life so Perry meantime kept his eyes open he's at scrambling back as far as he can go and he said that whale did this like heroic twisting turning in the air and I started going this way because the wave and I think that gave her clearance and the next thing I remember is like massive sound and pressure she landed on the kayak between the two of us God. and like driving us on like this god off this mighty sound as she hits us right and then pressure she's driving us under the water and the next thing I know like I my body took a breath before I went and thank god because I'm like 20 feet under the water swimming up through the swirling water like totally you know in shock obviously so there we are the kayak broke in half we're two miles offshore I'm injured it's sharky water and thank god we were not bleeding like they, they're covered in barnacles right and by some miracle she didn't abrade either of us we would have been certainly dead at that time but my uh, the, the two halves of the kayak they washed ashore a little bit later and mom took a picture of the where I was sitting and even though she landed behind me exactly where I was sitting is where the kayak broke so in essence the uh, I was the fulcrum for the breaking of the, the kayak the, the, the energy of the whale hitting us couldn't travel the length but it hit my sit bone and so my spine got compressed and twisted so I was was injured in the water but I'm a swimmer right so I couldn't do freestyle but I could do backstroke so it's like backstroked <laughs> anyways so that experience I mean that 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 moment between when I symbolically died because I did I mean as far as I knew I was dead and I, and I gave over my life as completely as one would right 
and then to be reborn, like symbolically reborn, like swimming out of the ocean again. That moment there, that moment occurs in my work over and over again now. You know, wow. yeah. That so is phenomenal. That's my Thank story. you. Thank you it. so much. You're welcome. Wow. Yeah, it, it was the most amazing thing. I mean, it was. It was. I mean, the story goes on. There's more near death things in the story, but it was. It, it was the most amazing thing that that's ever happened there. to me. That takes. Indeed. There. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, thank you so you're much welcome. for sharing thank that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sam has a really interesting installation of her ceramic sculptures and I'd like to ask you how you came up with the idea of these hanging tubes because I've had so many wonderful comments on them and what what was your inspiration how did you mm. Um, well, they're pipes to me. Um, they're a component of a larger installation that I did a few years ago called The Living Road. And like all of my work, I often am working with piles of simple objects. So often they could be um, simple organic things that you might find washed up on a beach or whatnot. But these to me are like piles of segments of industrial parts that are discarded and um, kind of rotting and, and able to be reclaimed back into the earth, so yeah, they're the industrial side of the organic, you know, influence that the work comes from. Yeah, because I, I can see when you say that because um, in a way this has the feeling of, of a rusted tailpipe yeah, or right. you know elements that you'd find um, just kind of separate or in the woods or, or whatever. And that's right. And I made the work in the Yukon oh. where there are actual like well, there's huge industrial sites that are being reclaimed back into the earth just by the process of, of aging, and there's real beauty in finding these piles of objects that are rusted and falling apart and and you know it's like in Cambodia and Angkor Wat like the you know nature is taking is reclaiming it, it back but there's something that I find you know really physically beautiful about about that and the piles of similar forms so you know it creates this this kind of narrative of wondering what they were at the time or your place within them or whatnot so I like working in multiples that way there's that sense of fragmentation as well where where they're they're not entirely whole some of them you know that they you see elements but um, when they combine together you, you have a far bigger uh, understanding well yeah that's right so this work here is very segmented but yeah this was a, this was one part of a, a project that was probably 150 you know components so you know there was a pile of discs underneath this work originally and um, there was wall pieces and yeah so the full installation as a whole does create a narrative where it's intended and you walk in and you know everyone's personal experience of that changes and how, and how the installation you know changes in different spaces is what's really interesting to me it seems so. like that's really the the essence of your work is is um, is creating a, a much bigger form and and um, you know combining a lot of different elements to create that form so that um, so that a viewer uh, entering a room with your work has an experience with that you know it's not just looking at a single object or a single piece of sculpture. It's it's like there's a sense of interaction and I love the, the sense that there's movement involved. You know, that there's, um, that they have a life of their own, that they occupy this, this space but they also um, occupy time and they, you know, so it, it's like you're constantly reminded of, of the movement of air and, and the, the wind and so on. So that's very, very interesting and I, I love some of the forms that you created such as the, the orbs, these these spheres that you they're they're just beautiful um, you know complete organic forms um, do you have a, a sense of where they came from well I think the sphere is a fairly universal orb or globe or, or you know the irregularity that you can you know 
shift that form to be is is a fairly ancient and you, you know universal form. So, but yeah, it's one thing to have one there, but it, when you make and exhibit, you know, 27 of them, then it really changes what they are. Same with like these little totems here. As a group of five, they're just a small grouping. As a group of 50, they become. Um, well, they become a narrative, like like I say, and depending on how they're 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 exhibited. So at one point in one gallery, I had them on a small, thin um, shelf, running along three walls of a gallery room, and they looked like this undulating musical pattern. And in Banff, I put them, you know, glued them to the floor, and they looked like one person even said they looked like um, hairs on somebody's head, which I thought was hilarious and random. To me, they were like a forest fire, but you know, super miniature and. Yeah, so it really, it, it changes when you have a simple form replicated. And I, I also, uh, I feel there's a real reference to ancient sculpture, to ancient artifacts, like like this one um, free form, it, it feels like a, a, an ancient Greek or Roman ruin that has been brought up from the, the bottom of the ocean, and, and the way that it has that, that um, the, the, the um, glaze that's on it, the crater glaze, it just feels like it's pitted and it has like this really uh, very interesting texture that you've incorporated. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a really great interpretation of that one piece. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks so much for, for talking about your work.